in the library at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, they have a couple really special items. One is a desk that belonged to the famous theologian Karl Barth. And I have seen grown-ups really geek out over it like they were seeing Elvis or something along those lines. But there with the desk is also a picture that he had. It's of the crucifixion of Christ. It's a beautiful picture. It's not entirely accurate, though. And the reason it's not accurate is because John the Baptist is in the picture. And if we know the timeline and the story of John the Baptist, um, he wasn't there. He was already beheaded at that point. He, he was dead. But in this picture, you have Christ crucified on the cross, and you have John the Baptist just standing there like pointing. He's pointing to the crucifixion of Christ as is to say, yes, this. This is exactly the thing I was talking about. This right here, this is the important part. Because everything that John did was supposed to point to Jesus. And we see that in our reading from John this morning. He's doing his job and he's, he's doing it well because that's his whole thing. He points to Jesus. His main job was as the forerunner. He came and said, the kingdom of heaven is near. That's what he kept saying over and over and over again. Jesus then comes and after baptized, begins his ministry, which is predicated on the assumption that the kingdom of heaven is here now. It's no longer an event that's going to happen in the future. Like, it's here right now. It's in your midst. So now what that means is that John's job has changed. It has to. It's, it's, there's a natural evolution and progression of jobs and how they work and things like that. And, and so this makes complete sense. He doesn't have to say the kingdom of heaven is here now if it's already here, as Jesus says, in the midst of the people right here and right now. And so now what's most important is not anything that John says, but everything that Jesus says. In the passage today, Jesus gets called a lot of things. John calls Jesus a lot of different things. John is attempting to get the people to be able to relate to Jesus in some way. There are still, to this day, to this day, as a 37-year-old adult, grown-up male who pays taxes, I can't call teachers by their first name. It's always Mrs. Smith or Mrs. whatever or Mr. whatever, and I can't... I can't do that because I believe that titles have inherent power, inherent authority. Words have power because words have meaning. And so the things that we call people or things carry a lot of weight and they're very important. And that's pointed out when we see John talking about Jesus. The first thing that Jesus gets called is the Lamb of God makes sense. Like, we understand from our position in history why that is the case. And the reason that John is using this epitaph to explain who Christ is is because he is literally trying to tie him to the Passover lamb. Any person, any, any child of Abraham who hears the Lamb of God will instantaneously make that association with the Paschal Lamb, with the Lamb for the Passover festival. People would recognize that image, and it marks Jesus as God's intervention in the world for the people of God. That's what the Lamb of God title means here, that God is doing something in the world on behalf of God's people. And if you're really paying attention, you would know uh, what kind of happens to the lamb. We could, you know, figure that out pretty easily. 
Jesus is then declared to be the Son of God. Not a Son of God, because in the Bible there were actually times where people said, oh, he was a Son of God. But the Son of God, and that distinction is important here. Because we're all children of God. We're sons and daughters of God, but we're not the Son of God, the specific one, the big one. And what this does is this points to this high Christology of who Jesus is. Jesus as God. And, and we start to see that being built up. And even in the beginning of John's Gospel, if you want the most high Christology of the four Gospels, you go with John. Because it has a very, very elevated, godly Jesus. First and forefront, and you get that right in the beginning of the book. People need to be able to relate to somebody in order to be a part of their lives and have them a part of their lives. And so John trying to get the people to understand who Jesus is just by calling him different things. And think about all the titles that we have in our own life. Mom, dad, brother, sister, uh, husband, wife, uh, all of these different titles. They each mean something different. Sam as a son is different than Sam as a father. But all of it is just a, a piece, an aspect of who we are as a person. And all of these have weight and they create how people view you and relate to you. And, and that is of the utmost importance here. And then Jesus gets called rabbi, teacher. And people are just drawn to him, wanting to follow him. John calls him the Lamb of God again, and, and people just follow him. They recognize him instinctively as a teacher, a, a rabbi, a learned person that they can teach from. And, and he turns around and asks them, like, what do you want? And, and the guys say, you know, teacher, we just wanted to see where you were staying. And all he says is, Come and see. And that's important. Because the minute that Christ invites these people to come with him, to see where he is, what he's about, all of that stuff, immediately following that, he is called the Messiah. A politically charged term that has a lot of baggage. Messiah meaning anointed. And at no point in any of this going on did Jesus use any of these titles to elevate himself. Like, he never walked into a room and was like, Hi guys, I'm the Messiah, the Son of God, I'm really important, pay attention to me. No, in, in fact, everything that Jesus did, he just let other people call him. And they had these expectations of, of who Jesus was. And they were able to relate to Jesus on this, this level. And, and yes, some of that is political because of what Messiah meant and what Messiah was supposed to do. But each of these titles are an invitation. It's Jesus saying, come and see. Jesus is the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Anointed One. Emmanuel, God with us, all of these things. Everything that we call Jesus is an invitation for us to relate to this Christ in some way. And that's exactly what happens. Because Peter now is compelled to follow Jesus. And he gets a nickname of Kephas because he's going to be the rock that the church is built upon. Jesus instantly looks at him and says, I'm going to call you Rocky. He gets a nickname right off the bat, all because he knew that he needed to follow Jesus. And it's kind of this beautiful image. It's this beautiful image of Christ knowing us and, and loving us and caring for us and giving us names. And it's beautiful because we know Peter, Kephas, uh, the rock the church was built upon, that's, that's a big deal. 
It's a very big deal because that, that's the beginning of it all. Except that we know what happens next. And what happens next in Peter's story is he dies. That's how Peter's story ends. He dies for a man he just met that gave him a nickname. He dies for the Messiah. He dies for the Lamb of God, for his rabbi. Whatever title you want to put here, that is who Peter gives his life for. This is what the invitation gets us. This is what relating to Jesus gets us. It's painful. It's, it's hard. It's what following Jesus is like. It's difficult. I mean, we even see that with John the Baptist. John the Baptist loses his head for the sake of God. The end of John's gospel, Jesus literally goes around and tells everybody how they're going to die. And you're like, that's the ending. That's what following the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Son of God, all of it, that's what it all gets us. There's an amount of frustration that I think we as individuals and as a church feel from time to time. And it's because we have this notion of what we want things to be like. We want things to go a certain way. We want people to come to worship on Sunday, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to go and be empowered in the world, and to make a difference in the world. It makes sense to us because we're here, and we get it, and we understand Lamb of God, the, the Son of God, uh, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. We understand this. We understand these titles, and we've, we've We've come and we've seen and we've followed and we want to do what's best for the world. We want to help with the world. And if we're being honest, things are not going how we want them to go. They aren't going the way that we feel they should go. Where we have people joining us in worship all the time. Where like there's like standing room only when we want to make a difference in everything that we do, it seems like it's, it's the wrong thing. And yet what we're doing is we're just, we're following Jesus. We were listening. We were doing what it was we were supposed to be doing. Like we came and we saw and we followed and we were empowered and we went out and we did these things and we felt excited. We felt jazzed. We had all of this energy, all of this power inside of us to become the superhero in this story. To be able to go into the world and change things. We have that power. Still, we have that power. We can be the superhero. But if we look at things objectively, we realize how hard it is to be that hero. You know, as a kid, I used to be enamored with the thought of, you know, being a hero and flying around up high in the sky and everything. I don't like heights. So I feel like it would be really weird if I was ever able to actually fly like that because I, I don't like heights. I, I don't function well with them. Like I never did trees as a kid. It, tall roller coasters you know, scared the, the crud out of me. And I've gotten better with them, but I don't like heights. And if, if we don't like heights, if we, if we can't stand using the powers, if we can't stand flying with clouds beneath us, what are we doing? We have the power to change the world. We have the ability to manifest our dreams and to make a difference in this world, but it's not happening. There's a disconnect. And we have to stop and think, why? Why is it going this way? 
Why is it this hard? Like I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, everything that I signed up for, that's what I'm doing, and yet I'm not seeing the results. It's like the day you start a diet and you eat healthy for one day and you're like, why didn't I lose 10 pounds? I worked so hard, I ate the, the grass food. I, t I did the walking thing. Why is, why I'm not seeing it? We felt dissatisfaction. And we feel the dissatisfaction that we read about from Isaiah this morning. Isaiah is less than thrilled at the current situation. And it makes sense. I, I understand it. The, the fruits of the labor are not being seen. And he even says, I have labored in vain. I've done all the stuff I'm supposed to do. Like, I, I have the power, the ability. Like, you called me before I was born. You made my mouth a sword so that I might go and do your work. I'm not seeing the results here. The labor is not paying off. The progress that was promised hasn't happened. It isn't happening currently, and it looks as if there is not going to be progress. I'm supposed to be the guy. He says, I'm supposed to be the one drawing the, the, the nation of Israel back together and like, and like calling the house of Jacob to, become, to come back and to be unified. And after all of this stuff, everything that has been going on, that's what I'm supposed to do. And I'm not seeing it. Every time I put in the effort, I put in the work, I'm not seeing the results and I don't understand why. And we've been there. We've been there and we have felt upset and saddened and, and hurt by the fact that we've done so much. And it never seems like it's enough. The labor and strength of the people coming back from the exile things didn't happen the way that they were supposed to. Everything they were doing was just not putting out the right uh, responses, the right results. And we felt this dissatisfaction because our lives are not perfect and they should be because we're doing the right thing. We're doing everything that we're supposed to do. We've answered the call of Christ, and yet here we stand, our churches are not perfect, and we are not perfect. We are doing everything we are supposed to, but we just don't see the dividends. That's what the servant is complaining about. I just, I've worked so hard, I've done what I'm supposed to, and I don't see it. God's great answer about all of this. The thing that you want to have happen, that, that the people want to happen, the whole drawing of the house of Israel, reconstituting them, all of that stuff, it's a very small thing. It's incredibly small. Yeah, we could focus locally. We could just do the one thing that you want done, but I have bigger plans. Like, that's easy, God says. I could do that, no problem. You could do that, no problem. But I want more. God is going after the reconciliation of the whole world. That's what the servant is actually working towards. It's not just like this one little thing. Not to say that, you know, post-exile stuff is little. Like, it's, it's big. It's huge. But what God wants is to draw all people towards God. That's what the servant is working toward. And never once in this passage did God ever say that it was going to be easy. God never says, you'll feel warm fuzzies inside of you. No, in fact, the only, uh, the, the, the hope in this passage uh, exists simply as God saying there will be a future justification. 
realizing and understanding, yeah, you're working hard, you're doing what you're supposed to right now. And it's, you're upset, I get that, I understand that. It's going to be okay. Everything eventually is going to work out. It might not be the way that we want it to be. We may feel dissatisfied and upset and, and frustrated because we think we put in all of this work, we do so much stuff, and, and it's just not working. Salvation reaches to the end of the earth, though. It's not a one and done thing. It is for all peoples. That's what the servant was working towards. That's what we work towards when we came and we saw Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the son of God, the lamb of God who washes away the sins of the world, the Messiah. That's what we signed up to do. And it is hard. It is tireless. We will not always see the results the way that we want them to. Your, scan your plans are barely going to work the way you want them to. What was the old saying? Man plans and God laughs. We aren't promised sunshine and lollipops now. We're promised the Messiah. We're promised Jesus. And what we know is that all of this has to do with God's vindication and love. It's hard. It's very hard to be an authentic follower of God. And if we look at it objectively, we don't think we can do it. We get disheartened, we get saddened, everything. And it's easy to sit around and be negative. It's easy to put more negativity out into the world. You're upset. I get it. I understand that. And so we want to be grumpy and grouchy and, and all of this stuff. But at some point, you have to realize that you're only adding more negativity in the world. When you have the promise of God, this hope that everything is going to be okay, eventually, not necessarily now, is that great? I mean, kind of. I mean, it's good that it's going to happen. We just want things to happen now. And so we get down on ourselves. We think, yeah, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. I'm only going to you know, work a little bit, not throw myself all in. And yet the call of Christ calls us to be all in and to follow Christ wherever that leads. We cannot do that on our own. And I don't think it would be fair for God to want us to do it on our own. But even if he wanted to, I don't think we could because we do it with the God of love, with the God who called us, with the God who wants us to be strengthened, who loves us and supports us. And that, in the midst of the disappointments we may feel in our day-to-day -day lives and for our churches and this, that, and the other thing, in the midst of all of that, the fact that God is there with us, giving us this strength. It helps. And it should hopefully give us a great sense of peace. Amen.